soon after that experience, I came here to the Rodsey United Church. I saw this amazing mural. And this was the song that I wrote in response to that, invited by Anne Hines to do it. Because the mural is painted around some stained glass windows which have biblical passages on them, particularly from what we call the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, where um, Jesus says, Blessed are those that mourn, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, and blessed are those who are meek. And I felt that the conversation between those words and the mural were very interesting. I've just been asked to turn it up a bit. Is that better?
This is the story of creation. This is the prophecy in humility and healing, in the gift of poverty. I long to walk together this path of empathy, and for all our children's children. Yeah. 
To, my name's Nancy, and I'm one of the members of the uh, Indigenous Relations Group here at the Ron's Tales United. And I just want to thank people for coming out tonight. Um, we're just calling this a reconciliation event, um, and we've been organizing this for a few uh, a few months, and we're really excited that people have come out. Um, as Tim mentioned, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Tim and Ruth for their music, for sure. Thank you very much for that. So when you came in, you got a little colored card, and if you would, uh, if you could put one or two words or thoughts um, about why you came to this event, and drop them in this basket. Uh, some people have already put them in the basket. It's we can just kind of go. We're not going to do it like an offering, you know, where we hand it down. But I'll just pass it down, and then uh, Tim is going to do something that he's done uh, in some of the other. Um, meetings that I've been with him, he does a, a visual summary of the event uh, using the words that people have um, have put down on paper. So thanks for doing that, Tim. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, when you came in, you got a little discussion sheet. And there's just two questions. Um, and you're welcome to jot down your answers, thoughts about those questions during the course of Margot's and Phil's presentations. Um, and the purpose of these is for those who want to stay afterwards, after the uh, after Margot and Phil have talked, um, we're going to have just little informal discussion groups. There's a couple circles there. There's another circle at the back. We're going to have some juice and cookies in the back. Take a little bit of a break um, after people have spoken, and then join into discussion groups. And the plan is kind of to use these two discussion questions to. Um, inspire a discussion, uh, what was meaningful for you and were you inspired to act by what you heard tonight, and then using the results of uh, what people write down, then uh, we're going to have a little bit of discussion, come back together again with uh, with Phil and Margot and have a discussion and a bit of a dialogue about this, because we're calling this a reconciliation event because um, what we try to do here is both to educate and to act, and those are both 
uh, equally important. So um, I want to begin the event formally um, with a land acknowledgement that uh, one of our members, Tim Oakes, is going to uh, share with us. So I'm going to read a traditional land acknowledgement that was written by Philip Cote. Roncesvalles United Church and the Indigenous Relations Group would like to acknowledge our presence on the land that has been the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee peoples since time immemorial. And in 1805, with the signing of the Toronto Purchase, is now the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. As we reach back to those first Torontonians, we remember our Mother Earth through the seven grandfather teachings. Wisdom, bravery, respect, honesty, truth, humility, and love. The stories of each of these nations endure and continue to guide our thoughts and actions on this land. And as we acknowledge our Mother Earth, we acknowledge the Medicine Wheel and its teachings. We recognize the four directions, north, south, east, and west, and the four seasons spring, summer, fall, and winter. It is these four seasons that represent the circle of life. Nindin Awem Aganegdok, which means all my relations, which means we are all related. So now I'm going to ask April students to come up. She's going to introduce Margo and our first speaker, but before she does that, she has a story to share with us that is relevant to what we're talking about tonight. April? Hi. Um, okay. So I wanted to share with you um, a story about my aunt. I'm not even sure saying I wanted to is the right way. When this topic came up, uh, a bunch of memories came back to me about my younger days, and it seemed relevant. And so I asked my the group if they thought this was appropriate, then I would like to speak about my aunt briefly. And so everybody said, it's a good fit. Um, I also asked my family, and I asked a lot of people <laughs> before I shared some of this. I'll, do, I'll share it briefly. Um, but I also, my aunt's been gone for a while, so I went to her gravesite and I also asked her permission as well to just share her story. Um, so I'm going to just briefly talk about her and then how her story impacted our family and what it's like to support somebody you know going through this as well. Um, so my aunt who I said has been gone for a while she used to look after her nephew Robbie. Um, there's a much bigger story but I'll, I'll give you the, the brief version. Uh, so one day he fell. Um, this is sort of a sad part, but this is this is the story. Um, so he fell, and my aunt put him to sleep. And he didn't wake up the next morning. He was very young at the time. So what had happened is, um, and I know this because I was young, but I was there and I heard the stories. Um, when the investigation was done, she was pushed and she was charged very quickly, right? Uh, and some of you may or may not know, she got a duty counsel, right, which um, encouraged her to take a plea deal, right? Um, they said, well, you can do two and a half years and you'll be in a provincial, you know, prison and uh, your family can come and see you, right? Or if you take it to trial, we really don't know what's going to happen and you'll be really isolated, right? So during a trauma, I, I mean, I can only speak from our experience, but I can and here when you're going through a trauma, right, um, you're also trying to make these life decisions at the same time. I can only imagine what my aunt, you know, to make this decision, right? So she decided to take the plea deal. Her aunt, her husband, actually both decided to take plea deals. So um, I just want, so from that point, I just wanted to tell you what it was like being a visitor if you haven't had this experience before, right? So um, if you're going to visit your loved ones in a prison, um, you don't just show up, right? 
you have to go through an application process, right, where they check your background and, you know, your pictures and your, a lot of information. So you have to be given permission to visit your family. And I looked at some of the old letters I had in my, you know, in my possession. They actually said things like the visiting hours are, there won't be any on Christmas, there won't be any on Boxing Day. So there wasn't, that wasn't even an option on those days as well, right? So, I mean, you can imagine how traumatizing that is to support your family. We did it, though. You know, we went to see my uncle. He was in, like, Mill Haven or Mimico. And then, if you're familiar with these, you know those names, right? So we would see him on Friday night. And then we would see my aunt, who was in Kingston Prison for Women. So Senator Pate's story, who, when I read her bio, actually, those, Kingston Penn came up. And that's where I remembered, like, we went to support her every Sunday. That was our, what we did as a family. But the process is traumatizing, even as a visitor, you know, seeing your loved one. If you never had to experience this, you're very blessed, right? But going in, there's a big wall where guards greet you and give you information. There's huge gates, right, that open and close very loudly. So it can be very traumatizing. And my aunt's story, it was hard for her. I mean, I just told you the brief part of the story, so it was difficult, to say the least. But we supported her, and, you know, she wrote me letters often. And like I said, she's been gone for a while. I brought two pictures, which I didn't have time to put anywhere, but maybe I can show you later. And so I just wanted to give you one small thing to finish off here. So when I started pulling out her letters, this was like 88, so I was pretty young, right? But I was learning guitar at the time, and I just, I felt like maybe my aunt was giving me this message. So she'd ask me if I would learn a song, and it's called Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree, which some of you may know. So I learned it. So I'm just going to sing you two lines of it, because I didn't realize how relevant it was, because I hadn't bothered to learn it. But so I'm going to give you two lines, and then I'll introduce Margo in a minute. I'm going home, I've done my time. I've learned what is and isn't mine. But if you receive my letters saying I will soon be free, you will know just what to do if you still want me. Thank you. So I think that's from my aunt. It's a nice way to end her message. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is less personal, but I'm going to read your bio. I'm just learning to get to know Margo, but she is wonderful, and I am sure I will have many things to say over the next few years. And some of you know her very well, so you know that already. But I'm going to read the details here. Okay, so Margo Van Slootsman is an award-winning poet and researcher. She was around the alumni of distinction from both Centennial College and Alabasta University for creating Sarbona, a new model of restorative justice. She is highly respected justice activist and political influencer who works across Canada and internationally to be a voice of resilience and empowerment, informing, reforming, and transforming justice policies. She teaches global citizenship at Centennial College, and in the year 2000, she was gifted with the spirit name Raven Speaks. So if you'd like to help me introduce her, that would be great. Thank you. My students know me for talking off the cuff, but the content that I wish to share tonight required me to put it in writing, so I'm going to read. Welcome everyone, and thank you. 
for that kind introduction, April, and also for sharing your story. I offer warm, heartfelt gratitude to and for you, Philip, to and for you, Ronsonsdale's United Church, and this community, which is an Indigenous relations group, centered on truth, centered on reconciliation. A process that includes both listening and acting from and with and because of the intellect of the heart something that my students at Centennial College do so very, very, very well. From the moment I stood beside this stunning gift, Philip Cote's wall of welcome, an evocative evocation of creation stories, whereby two distinct yet interconnected ways of knowing the world reside, I was struck by one tiny image. That tiny image says everything I need to understand about the framing of my worldview, my cosmology, my meaning of life. That tiny image and its vibrant color rests on the turtle. The turtle, which is my grandson Connor's favorite part of the wall of welcome. Connor knows this wall very well. That tiny image was the one chosen as the favorite of a young girl, Justine Bardisi, Karim's daughter, who stood with me before the Wall of Welcome on May 2nd, when the community, the, our, our community actually, our family and our friends gathered to celebrate and to honor its official launch. That tiny image is the reason for all I do how I do, where I do, with whom and why, both when choice is my own and when I am in situations that are random and that are unplanned. I invite you now to look at the turtle and to find the tiny red beating heart right over there, right over there the very heart of justice, which calls us to action via our own beating hearts, via our own precious and vital value in walking into the invitation to come into relationship with what would happen if our personal and community stories are dismissed, denied, and in the case of cultural genocide, decimated. A simple answer is this. Our heart health would fail. Our bodies, our minds, our souls would become disconnected, dissociated, imprisoned in the figurative sense and eventually over time in the literal sense. After my father's murder on Easter Monday, March 27, 1978, when I was a girl of 16, I knew with certainty, a deep and profound certainty, that my life too had ended. The certainty of a teenager who yet had no thread of restoring my own narrative, whose only recourse were attempts, several, at ending my life. There was another one, poetry, both writing it and reading it. Fast forward to 2007, when an email from one of my father's three murderers stood in my inbox, doing so because you read of my work with using poetry for the purpose of stepping into the raw, real, risky walk with trauma, surrendering to the knowing that closure and healing are life work which we never, ever, ever do alone. 
A short time after that email, while I was listening to CBC, while I was in the process of deciding if I wanted to meet that murderer, shortly after I had come from sharing time with poetry, in a very, very small room at the Calgary Remand Centre, sitting with young men, stubby pencils, tears, and their stories, I heard Kim Pate, who was not yet senator, speak of the atrocities that occur in jails. Kim, Senator Page, was actually supposed to be giving this talk this evening. She, was, um, she had to go to an international conference, so here I am. Thank you for the time and privilege. Excuse me, I have to blow my nose, which often happens. There we are, be prepared. I was a brownie for five minutes. You see what happens? Or was it three minutes? Um, <laughs> I emailed Kim and I told her that I supported her voice, her vision, her work, telling her of my own journey with murder to meaning. Almost immediately, Kim invited me to Ottawa to share a talk and my poetry with the Elizabeth Fry Society of Canada, to share with the women, a great majority Indigenous, whose worldviews were decimated. The repercussions of that were reflected in jail sentences because of a myriad a myriad of factors stemming from the murder of generations, including the murder of foundational meaning-making intricately, intricately tied to community, as Ronsonsville's United Church knows so well. The decimation of cultural links, knowings, wisdom teachings. The brutal decimation of cosmology. Victimized and criminalized people, each of us in fact, share several commonalities. One stark, cherished, and undeniable one is that little image right over there, and my earrings, by the way. The little image with the big, big, big meaning. The one on the turtle that Connor loves. That image, which is both in us and of us. That precious source of shared humanity. The red, beating, burgeoning, beauty-filled heart, which can be broken by bullets, which my dad's was, his name was Theodore, brutalized by the destruction of our self-worth when our life's meaning, which is steeped and nourished by community, is wiped out. Philip's wall of welcome and his teachings about the eighth fire is our invitation to the calls to action to come to know that even if and when we do not have the right words for expressing our relating to and our relationship with Sabona, shared humanity, our hearts will speak to us. Our hearts will speak for us. Our hearts will throb us into tender and compelling trust to come to understand, as Mary St. Clair, another kindred, for a time senator, right along, right alongside Kim, said, Murray said, the truth, the truth will set you free, but first, the truth will piss you off. Yes, our hearts of fire know that we are connected 
deeply connected. Even before we have the words to ask, the questions that I have asked myself each time I have been into a jail across this country, and I've been into many of them, as well as overseas. Specifically for Canada, these are the questions. Why is it, why is it that the prisons in Canada, in those prisons, the growing population is Indigenous women? I'll give you three words, but there are more answers. Indigenous women, victimized, face brutal violence and horrendous discrimination. Why is it that the very worldviews that created and contextualized foundational constitutional law in this country have so very, very little resemblance to Sabona, which is a new model of restorative justice and a deep and poignant kindred of the Eighth Fire. And further, the heart, after recognizing the ache therein, begins to ask, how can I offer of myself? How do I learn? How do I unlearn? How do I teach myself to open up, to invite engagement, by answers to what my cosmology is, my worldview is, in the personal, the professional, and the political of my life, in the very, very, very lifeblood of the truth and reconciliation's calls to action. The life-infused and life-affirming fact that on a freezing Friday night, we are here right now, is the heart's voice of wisdom, is one shard of a step to the decriminalization of Indigenous worldviews, which extend into leaning into what we will continue to learn from Philip's wisdom via the Eighth Fire, as that, that piece of beauty, poetry and paint, the wall of welcome, which is itself a throbbing, beating heart, continues to speak us into lived and into living justice. I would like to end my sharing with you with a poem. I wrote it specifically for tonight and I gift it to you. And this poem is contextualized in in words that were said to me by Archbishop Desmond Tutu when we shared a beautiful, lengthy, and very kindred conversation in Cape Town. We were chatting and then my friend Andrew was with me and, and Arch, as he said, just call me Arch, tapped me on my knee and he said to me, Margo, Margo, remember this, I did my walk my way, you, you do your walk your way. I wrote this poem from my heart to your heart, relating to the heart on that turtle, the heart that invites us to find what our way, as Nancy mentioned, to action is regarding the truth and reconciliation and the calls to action. My poem, your poem, is entitled Into the Heart into the flame of fire calling our voices lift us our fraught and fragile shames transform to light fresh as crystalline new fallen snow as each step we take into the core of justice spells the knowing that our hearts speak our shared humanity, that our hearts speak Savona. Thank you.
Thank you very much for those very from your heart words. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to invite William Bariton to just introduce Phil. You come on up, Phil. Come on up, Will. <laughs> Testing. Okay, thank you. Full disclosure, I've had bad experience with this mic, so thank you. Thank you, Tech. Thank you, Mac. And first of all, thank you so much, Nancy and Margo. I, I'm totally speechless, but at the same time, the turtle heart was beating, was beating when I heard it. So in that light, thank you, Margo, so much. And you know, and if anything, um, my name is William Brereton, and I'm humbled this evening to introduce Philip. As a community member who frequents this place of worship weekly to seek respite and reflection, I always sit nearby Philip's walls of welcome. I always sit in that vicinity. And the reason why I do that is that my time in the community would feel incomplete otherwise. I, more often than not, even while Margo was giving her, her speech, I was turning towards the buffaloes, the seven grandfathers, turtle. And in that light, Philip's mural means more than I can ever adic articul adequately articulate and signifies my gratitude for why I call this community home. There are also many times I do think I only attend church for the mural. <laughs> That's... <laughs> No, if anything, my appreciation for art as a spirit guide is endless. And if anything, it means a lot because coincidentally, I live on the same street as, the, as Philip Francisville's mural on Garden Avenue. And it's absolutely affirming the wonderfully painted by you, Philip, in 2018. I marvel at the regular sights and seeings of his other artistic projects in Toronto. Um, including this past year's Nuit Blanche as part of the Toronto History Museum's Awakenings program and at Fort York. And I've been equally, I've been in awe whenever I come across images of murals, of, of his murals appearing on TTC posters and even didactic labels at the Agahan Museum in North York. Whoa. Many spirits at work, all communicated through Philip's artistic signature. And without further ado, I'm, I'm happy to share his bio. A member of the a Moose Deer Point First Nation and affiliated with the First Nations of the Shawnee, Lakota, Potawatomi, Ojibwa, and Algonquin. Philip Cote is a young spiritual elder, artist, activist, historian, and traditional wisdom keeper. A graduate of Oakhead University's interdisciplinary Art Media Design Master's program in 2015, Philip has been exploring new ways to imbue sculpture and painting through oral traditions of storytelling and traditional spiritual practices. Perspectives, excuse me. His intent is to bring accuracy to the colonial archives through new research via archival and lived cultural practice and a deep understanding of cultural symbolism. Philip's great grandfather is the great grandson of Tecumseh and he is engaged in exploring the importance of the Shawnee leader's life and spirit. And there are a myriad of artistic projects, but I will highlight three of them. In January 2017, Philip received a grant from the Toronto Arts Council to create a mural depicting the Niagara Treaty for the University of Toronto's Massey College with the theme of Truth and Reconciliation, Canada 150. And after a process that involved an unlikely pairing, in other words, the artists in discussion with Reverend Ann Hines and community members of Ronson's Bell's United Church. Philip painted in the fall of 2021, which we are so blessed to see right in front of us, the first indigenous art mural inside a church in North America on Turtle Island. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then and the fact that a beautiful opening ceremony celebrating its birth occurred in May 2022, and showcasing this unique docu this unique journey, a documentary entitled The Eighth Fire, produced by Canadian Latino filmmaker PJ Marcelino and Indigenous filmmaker Joe Pru, debuted during the event and has since received international recognition in countries such as Cabo Verde off the coast of Western Africa. 
And furthermore, the most beautiful thing about this evening is as I look around my peripheral vision, the amount of commission, new commissions and goings that Philip is up to, this beautiful work in progress we see will be on display at Mohawk College. So we're very blessed to see multiple finished progress and to see Philip's beautiful artistic trajectory. Oh yes, and go to Garden Avenue. So I mean, as you see, it just it keeps expanding, expanding, expanding. And as an indigenous artist, the purpose of Philip's research is to unearth and reveal his cultural experience and knowledge of the science and indigenous symbols, language, and interpretation. Openings are thus created both within the archive academia and the broader public that enables these embedded stereotypes to transform under the gaze of an indigenous based interpretive presence and intervene in the cross-generational colonial bias. And before I hand it off to Philip, as a token of immense gratitude from all of us here this evening, and from particularly not only just from Roncesville tonight, but everyone who literally, every, all of you I'm seeing right in front of you, this gift from all of us to you, Philip. I, we would like to give you this sack of tobacco, which came from the Peace Garden. And you're on my left hand. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Philip. Thank you, guys. Let me flip on this uh, contraption. Can you hear me now? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Very good. Um, so miigwech to uh, everyone here supporting me, Anne, Margo, Cassie, and of course uh, our, present, our announcer here. Um, you know, I, I've had a really uh, difficult time trying to figure out exactly how I was going to present this, uh, uh, this idea of uh, the criminalization of indigenous culture. And uh, I, I didn't know if I should just take a scholarly approach and just go do some research and impile, compile everything together. And uh, I tried that. That wasn't working. So I decided I was going to uh, take a look at my family history because uh, that's the best way to tell a story about the effects of colonialism and the effects of that criminalization of our, our culture and how people learn to deal with it. And uh, my family is a, a prime example of uh, you know, that kind of uh, resilience, persistence, and belief that uh, we were put here for a very important reason, and it certainly wasn't that. And uh, so um, I, I, uh, I'm going to do my usual. First, I'm going to just uh, work on on this. Uh, I wanted to start with our our culture, uh, the beginning of the universe. But uh, even before we do that, I'm going to uh, I want to do as much. Uh oh, is that working? Yeah. Okay, something's going on. There. I came prepared because I wanted to uh, do this properly. You know. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to do a little smudge before I start talking, and I want to do a song, a traditional song. So I want to clear my thoughts, my vision, my voice, my hearing, my body, my legs and feet, 
And last and most importantly, I want to clear my heart. So I'm preparing myself now to speak um, because I'm going to talk about my ancestors. I'm going to talk about some of these uh, cultural kind of um, parameters that uh, bring our cosmology into oral um, space. So um, I'm going to do a song. And uh, this is a song that I did for uh, So I'm going to do this, um, this is one of my favorite songs, I like singing this song, this is a song about the pipe, we call that, uh, that medicine or that uh, ceremonial pipe, we call it a chinupa, and you'll, you'll hear it in this song. idea of uh, our culture being outlawed meant that we couldn't sing a song like that and we couldn't do it in an open area we couldn't gather three or more indigenous people and uh, this um, outline of our culture was uh, here until 1952 and uh, so it wasn't until 1960 that indigenous people were given the right to vote so the main obstacle for indigenous people all along has been representation. So indigenous people haven't been represented since the arrival of these new people from the Europe. And uh, so this is a really important beginning that I'm going to talk about here, talking about the beginning of the universe, talking about the great black void, 
and how in that black void there was a spirit, and that spirit sent four signals out into the universe, waiting for a response, and when there was no response, that spirit called those signals back and said, as you come back to me, create light in the universe. And at that moment, all the stars were born. And from all those stars, planets began to form until a planet could, that could hold life was formed. And that's where we come into the universe. And so that's the arrival. So the four elements... Next, next. So the four elements were drawn up from the earth and they were uh, put, put together to form that first human. That first human was lowered to the earth. So that's our creation story. That's how it begins. And it sounds pretty fantastic when you think about it. Uh, but when you think about all the creation stories around the world, you have to wonder about how and why they saw those things. But it's those very stories that are really important because it's those stories that tie the people to the land. And that is a really number one thing. Because, you know, when, you, when you're going out on your daily chores through this thing called life, you know, you have a job, you have a roof over your head, you have to get food, you probably have to look after your children. If you have children, you have to, you know, support them some way. But when you go out into the road or out into the street, you know, when you're walking down that street and you're milling about doing your thing in this uh, society, you know, you don't often think that uh, you don't belong. You feel like you belong here. This is what your purpose is, that somehow your world is connected to this life that you, you have built around this society the way it is. So indigenous people for a long time uh, didn't have that feeling because, you know, when I was a child, I remember I didn't feel like this was my home at all. And because uh, I wondered like, uh, how I was supposed to fit in here because I didn't feel accepted in a lot of the places that I grew up in, in downtown Toronto. And, uh, but I just wanted to, you to take a look at this for a second because this is really important. Um, this is something that was part of that uh, ways that our culture was outlawed. And how that works and operates is that, uh, you know, this is our whole story here on this board. And it's a pictographic form. It's done on a birch bark scroll. And it starts in the beginning. So if you go right to the end where those four little guys are in a round circle, that's the beginning of our story. It's the beginning of the arrival of that first human. They're getting ready for that first human. So they're making way and they're there's four stages to this purpose of getting this human ready to come. And so you can you can see those little bars in front of those guys up and runs up and down on that pathway. Then there's a little guy in between the two long bars. That's the arrival of the first man. So he's come and he's come to learn his teachings and he and he goes through these stages of life. And uh, what's important is that these four stages that he goes through, we are all, all going to go through. So he is the one, first one to go through those stages of life. So, you know, we have a medicine wheel. It has four quadrants on it. It's divided into four elements and four kinds of power. So in the beginning, that first power is the water. And that's the, where we all come from because our mothers carry us for nine months in water. And so we all come from there, so we don't understand that completely. So the second stage is when we go to uh, the air stage. This is when we begin to start communicating, start thinking about our experiences in that first stage. And we start putting a oral language to that experience. We build this thing called knowledge in ourselves and our experiences. And uh, this is really important because this, these two things, these two stages are getting us ready for the third stage. So the third stage is really important because this stage is the fire stage. So this stage in your life, you begin to understand what this is all about. And this is the sacred fire right here. And that sacred fire is the one that has all this kind of passion and drive. So that if you have a, an idea, if you believe in something, this is where the fire for that is going to come from. And that passion, you know, is very dangerous stuff. Because, you know, revolutionary leaders, you know, thrive on that. You 
know, so watch out, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important, you know, this, these, these stages are going through. You know, this is, uh, I'm just giving you an overview of like how they really operate. And so the, now that you've gotten to this, so I think that's really interesting that that part becomes a focal point of the, the mural and because it's the sacred fire and because it's a thunderbird carrying that heart. And that thunderbird sits in the east, the western door. You know, and that's the, it's part of like uh, this, this connection to the ancestors. You know, I just did a, a birthing ceremony for, for people that just uh, made some drums and they want to start using them and I started talking about uh, why this was important. And they said the sacred fire is the, the important part because what we're doing is we're introducing you and your drum to the ancestors. So when we make a sacred fire, we're making a gateway to the ancestors. And so the thing with this drum, when I use that drum, I'm calling those ancestors. That drum is the doorway to their, where they are. So when I hit that drum and I start singing, those ancestors are coming around me to listen. And you know what? They're coming around me to help me speak too. Because I, I know that, uh, you know, when I get up and speak a lot of times, I too sing, say things right off the cuff. I don't write things down. Because I, I know that I have to go by the energy in the crowd. When I get up and talk, I go with the energy. And even when I'm doing a ceremony for people, and there's a large group of people, their energy is pretty, it fluctuates a lot. Because there's so many different kinds of people going in different directions in the, in the world. And so you have to find a way to kind of bring balance to that. So the thing that brings balance to that is the, the great force above, you know, comes down and works on that circle and it connects all the people together. And everybody gets into the same mode eventually and then they, they kind of come together. And what's important about coming together uh, is that you, um, you have a sense of belonging. So there's, there's some really important things uh, about getting to this place where you get a sense of belonging. And it's a place you call home. You know, and home could be anywhere on the planet. If you get that sense of belonging anywhere on the planet, it's home. And I think that's a really important thing for us all to know and understand that whatever we're doing in the world as human beings, that we have a sense of belonging. And so the last stage is really important because that last stage is the earth stage. And how long do I have to talk? So I'm going to keep control of this thing. Okay, so the last stage is the earth stage. And that stage is a very magical point in your life. You guys will be 75 or older by that time, and you'll probably be like an old rugged warrior by that time. You know, because 75, that means you've been through the mill and saw everything, and now you're just kind of cruising along, just saying, oh, I don't know what's going on. And I know where we're going to go and all that stuff. But that stage is really important because that stage is when the doors open up to the two way communication with the universe. So the universe comes down through now you because it knows you've been in here and it's given you this access now where you begin to have uh, questions about this purpose of why you're here and you begin to see those deeper meanings and purposes about your whole life experiences. You begin to see that, okay, you know, that crap I went through when I was 25 wasn't for nothing. <laughs> you know, I had to learn something in order to get to this next stage in life. And so, at this time, now you can start asking for things, and the universe is going to start showing you things right on your path. So I don't know what it will be. But you guys, when you get to 75 or older, you put your, you know, if you want to follow my kind of teachings, you can put some tobacco down on the ground and ask for something and see what happens. You know, you can even do that right now. It doesn't mean you don't have to be 75. And things happen, you know, and um, you don't question anything. So if you do get an answer for the question that you put down, put out there to the universe, you know, it's a, it's a great thing because, you know, this whole institution, 
is about uh, faith, giving people a sense of faith and that they're in the right place and they're in here for the right reasons. And uh, sometimes, you know, we get lost and we can't see exactly where we're going to go in the future. Don't be afraid. Uh, just uh, as my grandfather and my grandfathers have said to me, you know, if you get scared, just stay put. Don't do anything and watch. And then you'll see some new vision will happen on your trail and your trail will divide into two roads and that will be your choice to go down this road or that road. It'll come, you'll see. So uh, uh, I'm talking about all this because uh, there is, this is the thing about uh, you know the criminalization of the culture but it's also about um, the narrative. Our narrative vanished over time. And so indigenous people really do have an identity problem. That's the main reason for a lot of uh, indigenous people that are incarcerated. They're in the correctional system uh, because they don't have a sense of identity. I went and worked in there for a few years. I started doing that with Vern Harper in 1980. Uh, if you can imagine, like that was quite a long time ago. And the prison systems were really different. The whole education system was so different. Vern was way ahead of his time. You know, I don't know if you maybe know Vern Harper, but he was a really great activist and he was, had a great heart. And he was brought back, you know, he was like an old time warrior that was brought back to help this generation of people, the Seventh Fire people. The Seventh Fire people, and some of you guys are the Seventh Fire people. You know, you were brought back at this time to help this get this thing ready for all these people to go into the 8th fire. We're in the 8th fire right now, okay? So it was all these 7th fire people that were brought back as, you know, you know, who knows what they were in other lifetimes. And I know I'm probably uh, expanding upon some of what you guys think is um, you know, regular kind of uh, information and knowledge. But, you know, indigenous people, we always believe that we come back many times because our medicine wheel says it. So we have that four directions and that's the beginning of life here and, and it goes around and comes back to the beginning where we're getting near the end. So it keeps going around and around. So we come back many times. And so I, I know that myself, I believe it myself. That I've been here many times and this is important because you know sometimes blood memory is kind of held in in, the, in these physical forms, and that sometimes we access that blood memory by uh, by doing familiar things, like uh, learning about the culture, learning about what your culture is. And that's the only way ahead for a lot of indigenous people, is to go back and take those steps. But um, what I want to do now is I'm going to share this, some of this timeline that uh, some of you probably haven't heard of, but maybe you have. Because... Uh, so the timeline, this is uh, number one. Timeline starts a million years ago for indigenous people. That's two ice ages according to our oral histories. And Western archeology span says that indigenous people have only been here for 13,500 years. That's according to their Western ways of doing things because they haven't found any evidence of us being here according to our oral histories. We are relegated to a really short time here in North America. And then I think that's, uh, that's going to happen for a long time because, you know, the West relies on empirical evidence where indigenous people rely on this oral history. And the oral histories are much more um, truthful than a lot of written history is because when you look at history, especially according to indigenous people and relating to indigenous people, you'll find that there's a lot of inaccuracies when talking about us. And so for me, uh, as a, an indigenous uh, you know, medicine person and scholar, I have my foot in these two worlds. And I realized it was important for me to do that, to get that education in order to see exactly what all of this, uh, you know, the Western paradigm, how they see indigenous people. It was really important for me to see these two worlds. And I realized that I'm going to be an interpreter of this because I'm going to be focused on how and why our culture is so important to practice 
and how it's important that we have an understanding about how this this Western bubble surrounds our physical world. And we, we have to be a part of that too. So uh, new evidence found in the Credit River is the reason why we put that mark around here in this part of uh, North America at 13,500 years ago because a knife was found in the Credit River back in 2010 and they dated that knife to be 13,500 years old. And so at that time there was a uh, what they call Paleo Indians, known as the Vyas, as the Okuminganiniwak, which are which means the uh, ice runners, the gatherers and hunting, uh, megafauna, woolly mammoth, rhinoceros, panacerotheriums, megatheriums, camels, mastodons, horses, saber-toothed cats, short-faced bears, and, and many many other animals that were part of the megafauna. This is what our ancestors were hunting here in Toronto, you know, right in the streets here, right? You know, I think if you think about the Davenport Road, Davenport Road was this gigantic ice wall that was, you know, a, a kilometer high, and it was sitting right there. And that became the, the place where, uh, became a hunting ground for the people that were living here. And this is where they would come to hunt those giant uh, animals. So the ice age was here, and there were glaciers that would reach a mile high, so two kilometers high, Davenport Road, the ice receded and it created these uh, lake called, what uh, the archaeologists call it, Lake Iroquois, leaving rivers and creeks, and all of these rivers and creeks were running in a northwesterly direction off of Lake Ontario. So if you look on a map, and you look from above, you'll see all the way that these tributaries are all going northward to the Holland Marsh and then on to uh, Lake Simcoe. So that is part of the, you know, the trade network that was here in this area. I'm not going to even talk about that. It's going to be time, too long to talk about that. Sometime, maybe I can talk about it in the future. And uh, so uh, uh, this is important to know because uh, indigenous people knew this land like the back of their hand. And if you ask an indigenous person, you know, 200 years ago, to draw you know, a map of the area. They would draw all the details, all the tributaries going northward. They would show you how to get to Georgian Bay and onto Lake Superior and all the way out to the Rocky Mountains. They knew how to travel these riverways, these waterways, or the highways that the indigenous people learned and knew uh, that it was important to have a handle on. So, you know, part of the reason why I'm talking about this whole history like this right now, and I think it's important for you to keep in mind why I'm sharing all this, is because this is history that wasn't spoken of before. And even today, you can't go and find this history in, in schools. So I am, uh, I am a, a partner with the TDSB, so uh, I have this uh, uh, relationship with them where I'm a, an elder, an artist, historian, activist, and I go into the schools, and I bring in this kind of knowledge into the schools to, to change the minds of the young people, because they have a very uh, flat and stereotypical image of uh, who indigenous people really are. And even now, there's a, there's a modern version of us, you know, we're activists and we're troublemakers, and we make blockades, you know, set fires, that's another kind of way that people look at us, but they're not looking at the cause of these effects. They're not looking at the reasons why uh, we are such activists, because this representation, this idea that I talked about earlier, is still isn't here. Even today, we don't have representation. And if you look at, like for me, uh, logically, when I look at all the treaties that were written, and I'm going to talk about it in these slides, all those treaties were written. Uh, they should all be uh, ripped up because uh, each one of these treaties that were signed, the indigenous people did not have any representation. They didn't have access to a lawyer that told them exactly what they were signing. So all the treaties are really, they're null and void. They should be. Um, I'm not trying to start a riot here, but I'm just pointing out facts. 
because it's important, you know, because you even need to know these facts too. So uh, Lake Ontario shoreline would be at Devonport and uh, Lake would have been three or four times larger than today's Lake, today's Lake Ontario. So if you can imagine after that ice melted, the whole area, like the valley, uh, that created our Lake Ontario. Now, if we, if we got rid of all the water in Lake Ontario, you would see it's a little river running through everything. You know, so who knows, we might see that river again one day, because we're having global warming, things are changing, right? Um, so the story of the ice runner, uh, ice runners placed First Nations people in this world here in Toronto 13,500 years ago. Not to mention our story of being uh, here for the last two ice ages. So the last two ice ages, that story comes from uh, Wasoxing, uh, an elder, um, a Medeon elder. He, he says that we have stories that take us back two ice ages. And you know, I believe him. And his name is Stuart King. So if you want to look that up to confirm things, you know, when I'm talking about these things, you know, you can always go and look it up and maybe go visit him this summer. Uh, they have a powwow up there on Perry Island. Perry Island is known as Wasoxing. Okay, so it's not far from here. And when they have that powwow, they have a Medeon Lodge set up. And you can go in there and uh, hear some stories and maybe hear that story again about us being here for two ice ages. I think this stuff is all pretty fantastic, you know, when you have access to your elders and you can go and um, quote them, saying, hey, can I share this? And they say, yeah, go ahead, share it. It's, it's awesome. It's like having a good professor. <laughs> you know, the professor says, oh, yeah, you can share it. <laughs> so uh, the Ojibwe arrived before the mention of the knife found in the Credit River two ice ages ago and then the Wendat arrived around eight to 9,000 years ago to now uh, Lake Ontario area and Haudenosaunee arrived to the, the southern shores of Lake Ontario. So I'm, the reason why I'm talking about this is because, you know, we have a land acknowledgement and uh, a lot of times the land acknowledgement is so uh, twisted, I, I just have to bite my tongue because I can't say two words because I'm in these institutions that have written this land acknowledgement and it's not correct. Now, so you might ask yourself, so what, so what makes you the expert? No? Well, I'll tell you what makes me the expert is because these oral histories are older and more accurate than the Western um, archives. Okay, so the archives are all Western-based uh, descriptions, and those descriptions are inaccurate because, you know, when those first explorers came across the land, they didn't ask us about our culture, or our history, or our political protocols. Now, if I, you know, if I take a look at some of, some of that history, that history actually um, tells you what was going on just by the way they say it. So now, when they talk about, you know, those uh, original explorers, you know, like Champlain and. Uh, and at Jimberle, how they came across the land and, and like they were, you know, leading the Indians around, because that's how they say it. So when they bring those explorers across, and they don't, they tell you who's taking them. So when they tell you that the Algonquins are taking them across all these territories, it's because the Algonquins have access to all these territories because they are big shot political figures in this land. That's why they could move across that land without any bloodshed, without anybody retaliating, without anybody attacking them, because they were the controllers of the land. So the Algonquins were connected to the Ojibwe, the Odawa, the Potawatomi, the Chippewa. I'm gonna, I have a list here. I'm gonna read through the list of people that are connected to these Ojibwe's. Who are the descendants of the Ice Runners? So, these were very fierce and clever people, and they had a great military um, security around their territory, just like tobacco. You know, tobacco 
than the plant. It protects its own territory. If you grow a tobacco plant in your garden, and it grows nice and big and has a big flowers and everything, you'll see that none of the plants are near it. It says, hey, this is my territory, don't come close, there's gonna be trouble. So tobacco and indigenous people are very much the same. That's interesting, huh? And it's deeper than that, it goes, it goes really deep. And you know, this, these kind of deep thoughts lead to deeper thoughts. And I can't get into that tonight, like I really want to. And maybe we'll get together, maybe we'll do some workshops here in the corner here and I'll share more information. And you guys can uh, come and learn. Like I just told the drum group uh, that I was working with the other night, I said, hey, you know, we're gonna get into some heavy stuff here and I'm gonna draw some maps that take you out to the edge of the underworld. And we're gonna look at those maps and you're gonna figure this out for yourself exactly what that looks like and how that feels to hear this and see this information because it changes you. Knowing things change the way you walk through the world. Um, there was a guy, uh, a French a philosopher, uh, he was talking about black skin, white face, and he talked about uh, how a person feels when they, they know that they've been discriminated against. And he said what happens is that uh, the person's schema is affected. So what does that mean? Anybody, anybody knows? Anybody know what that word means? So it's talking about the way your body moves through the world and how you stand. So when, you, when you've been uh, marginalized for generations, uh, it affects the way you stand. And you don't stand like a person who's free. You stand like a person who's under oppression. And so a lot of black people, they have that stigma that's connected to them and they don't know how to break it. But I'll, I'm gonna tell you how to break this because that's what happened to indigenous people too. We've experienced that stuff too. And so how we break that is we find out who we are. If you have a sense of identity, this breaks down all of that misrepresentation, all of that stereotyping that different nations face, it starts breaking it and it dismantles it. And this is really important stuff because, you know, knowing about yourself gives you power. There's power in knowing who you are and how you should see yourself and knowing that when these, these negative things come at you from all angles, all levels, that if you know who you are, it bounces right off you. It doesn't hit you the same way as when you didn't know who you were. Because for all you know, all that negative crap that they're saying about you could be true, and maybe they're right. So that's the way it is until you know who you are. And you know, this, this information you're getting tonight, this is for everyone. You don't have to be indigenous, you don't have to be black, you don't have to be Asian to get this. Because even you settlers, you know what I'm talking about because you experienced this too. So, Huh? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so I'll, I'll get into that. So listen, okay, just let me get through this one page and then we're going to go back. So, okay, the seven fires come to the people many years ago, put the people on a great migration. So the seven fires, like who are these seven fires? Well, they're a, they were luminous beings that came out of the Atlantic Ocean. And those people that were on the shoreline were the uh, Mi'kmaq and, uh, and uh, I'm trying to think of their name. But they were the people that they now call the Anishinaabe. They were there too on the eastern shores when those seven fires came out of the water. And they talked about the seven, seven changes that were gonna come and that they were gonna come to this place called the seventh fire. And when we got to the seventh fire, in the process of that seventh fire was 
everything was getting ready to be coming into the eighth fire. And so we're in the eighth fire, and but we still have the seven fire people here because they're needed. A lot of the seven fire people were warriors. We called the warriors back here to open up this uh, this um, this road to the eighth fire. They were called to open that road up. And why is that? What was that important? Because uh, it's the there was a certain kind of destiny that was part of uh, the reason for everybody coming in at this time. So if you were born in the 50s and 60s, you were meant to be here for part of the seventh fire. And I think that's really important because uh, that's part of this idea called destiny, that there's a reason and purpose why you're here, and it's because you were brought here in this time that was going to be this great change, which is the eighth fire, which happened on January 21st, 2021. That is the beginning of the eighth fire. That night is when it started. I went out to our camp that night because I wanted to see if there was a, I could see something physical come and change. So I went out there and I lit a sacred fire and I waited, I waited and waited until it got to around 11 o'clock. And I said, oh, okay, well, I guess nothing's gonna happen. I thought maybe I might see something because this is an important time. Because an elder told me that this day was important. And I, I didn't understand back then when he said it to me. And then I realized it's because that's the beginning of the eighth fire. So when I went there, I, I put my, uh, my <laughs> I put my recorder on my phone, and I just filmed everything around because maybe I said maybe I can't see it, and maybe I should put my film. So I filmed around and filmed the sky, and, and I went back to that fire, the sacred fire, and I realized when I. When I put my camera across the sky, all these faces were looking at me in all the clouds. And I said, holy crap. <laughs> so it's like this, you know, this test of faith. You know, okay, so yeah, they do look like faces, but is that my answer? That they actually did come to see if I was going to come and see if they were going to, this thing was going to start. So, um, so it's a question mark, and that's okay. Uh, I think, uh, you know, my journey, like right from the beginning, has been about faith. And uh, so I, I, I brought a lot of good memories here with me tonight because I wanted to share a more personal journey about this criminalization of indigenous culture. You know, so you can see for yourself uh, what my, I experienced and what my family experienced and who, why I am who I am. I am, I am this way and because of my family. They supported me so that I could do this journey what I'm doing right now. Everyone, um, my elders, uh, my brother-in-law, they, they, they weren't doing what they were doing. I would not be standing here today. It's those people that um, had a lot of courage to get up and be activists and uh, say uh, that we have rights and that we should uh, always be able to get up and speak no matter where we are, no matter what kind of opposition we have, uh, especially when we know we're right and that we've been wronged and that we have a lot to say about those wrongs that continue today. So, um, so these seven fires, they come out of the Atlantic Ocean uh, and it's in uh, 692 AD, that's when they roughly think this happened. So around 1200 years ago, the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, and so those people were called the Wabanaki, uh, that were once the Wabanaki, but then became later known as the Anishinaabe. So the Anishinaabe people aren't old at all. They're very young. They're only 1,200 years old. But we're talking, when we talk about the Ojibwe, we might be talking about uh, three million year old people because they say, uh, that there's possibly that there was three ice ages that we've been here for. for. If you go back three ice ages, it's almost five million years. So the, we're talking about a really ancient race of people that have been have vanished according to the settler archives because they didn't ask our ancestors about who we were. 
they never asked those people about who they were or our history. So it vanished because it wasn't documented. It wasn't put into the archives. Only guesstimations and things about who we are were put in there. So we really can't rely on those archives to describe us. So we're still a big mystery. Uh, probably going to take people like myself to really bring these stories out and write about them and put them out and, and people can, can then, then expand upon those. Uh, because, you know, that's what's great about uh, publishing. When you publish something and people read and they say, oh man, and then they go looking for more things and it expands it. So, you know, yay. <laughs> yay for scholars. <laughs> So, um, when that arrived, the three fires settled as well. And in uh, 1532, uh, Jacques Cartier, a French explorer, had tried. It should be 1752, but I have the wrong number here. Because his people had a uh, bounty. So, the reason why he creates this peace and friendship treaty, why he fights for it, because his people have a bounty on their heads. Uh, the men have a 20 pound bounty on their heads, the women have a 15 pound bounty on their head, the children have a 10 pound bounty on their heads, and so I did some research on that, uh, that number, 20 pounds, 20 pounds was uh, $1,700, so that was a lot of money to those settlers, to those farmers that weren't doing well their first year, so they probably had to buy food just to, to get by, they couldn't, because they weren't farming properly if they didn't know exactly how to farm. So they were, they were suffering when they got here, but you know they wanted to be here because it was a lot worse in Europe. Because in Europe you didn't have access to land, you didn't have access to hunting because the, the imperial rulers uh, would not let uh, their subjects uh, hunt on their, on their grounds. So people could not hunt or, or farm or do anything in Europe. It was better to be here. Uh, and so, so that's a big deal, you know, getting that uh, amount of money, 20 pounds for a, uh, a man's scalp. And so, incidentally, uh, that is where the term redskin comes from. So a lot of people don't know that. You know, so when the team, uh, baseball team, started using that term redskin, uh, they were saying it was because it was, the, you know, it was the might of those warriors and able to defend their land against uh, intruders. But that's not so. It was really about the bounty on those people's heads. And, you know, it was happening from 1700 to 1650, and it was the British here in Canada that had the bounty on everyone's heads. And so they thought it was important that they could put that money on those heads because it would get rid of problems that they'd have to deal with more. It would lower the population of indigenous people pretty quickly. Because if you saw a bunch of these settlers, they were doing so poorly uh, with their farming and things. Because they didn't know how to farm. And they didn't have any farming skills. The indigenous people were the ones with all the farming skills. They knew how to plant crops. And they knew about fertilizer. And they knew exactly the, how and what kind of plants could produce you know, uh, nitrates for the soil. So that the soil would be rich enough to grow the plants. Which was, you know, the beans, corn beans and squash. It was the perfect combination. But that's just a small sample, you know, because they say that it was bigger than that. It wasn't just the three sisters. There was sometimes where there were 15 plants all together that made up this little circle that would feed itself as it was growing. So you didn't need to ruin the whole soil. The soil would get looked after as it was growing each year. It would never be depleted of those minerals needed to grow your crops. So that's getting into a whole another branch. I don't get to talk about that. So Lac Toronto was later referred to as the Narrows, a channel of water through which Lake Simcoe discharges into Lake Kuchichi. So this is important because, you know, uh, if you look on old uh, French maps in the early part of this discovery of this world, you'll see that, uh, that uh, what we know as Lake Simcoe is called Lac Toronto because it was uh, in La you know, Toronto, uh, in the Wendat language means uh, fishing weir, or where sticks stand in the water, or where people gather. 
Those are the three uh, references that that word means. And so we talked to a, a Wendat elder, and he said that um, all three of the terminologies are correct. You know, when we talk about uh, specific uh, words like that, like Toronto, we're talking about an activities, we're talking about the process that it takes to, to catch fish and dry them and prepare them for travel and prepare them for storage. And so that's what was going on. So when you were catching the fish there and you're you know, skinning the fish and hanging them up to dry, getting them ready for you know, storing, that took uh, weeks. So you were there for weeks. You'd be there uh, talking to other people from the region and getting a load down on what's going on in the whole region just by hanging out there, getting your, your fish ready for your community uh, for, the, for the winter. Uh, so this was really great. That's just a small part, but it's an important part. And that small part is the beginning and it's the fuel for the trade network that was going through Toronto over the last 5,000 years. And that was the, the main hub up there in uh, Lake Simcoe that was the, the fuel for that uh, trade network that went from here to the Northwest Territories down to Central America and back up through Middle America, right up through the Ohio River, all the way up to Toronto. So this big triangle was a huge trade network and even uh, up here they could have a, a cup of cocoa on a Sunday morning because cocoa was being part of that uh, the goods that were traveling northward from the south. Um, so I'm not making up any of this stuff, you guys. This is all research that I've done when I was working on my thesis, and I, I thought, I'm going to hang on to this. This is important stuff. As soon as I was on my thesis one day, here it is. I'm using it. So um, uh, the Haudenosaunee Seneca arrived here around 1650, and because of the fur trade at this point. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the uh, Babby Point, that is a Seneca village. That was a Seneca village that was there. Uh, but it, you know, it's wrongly, it's been misquoted, uh, misrepresented as a, a village that somehow that they were part, they owned this territory. No, what that was there, it was a trading port that they were operating. And they made an agreement with the Ojibwe to have a trading port there. So the Ojibwe, they didn't want to go all the way to Montreal. So if these guys want to go to Montreal, fine, we'll bring it here and they can trade. Right, so that's how it really was. That's what was going on. And I know that story isn't out there, but that's the story I'm, I'm telling. And I think my story is really correct and, and very close to the truth because, you know, they found the lady, when they were digging up the curves, they found the lady under the sidewalk. And everybody was just thinking, if it was a full skeleton, they realized it was a really ancient skeleton. You know, it was from uh, 1650. So, anyways, the lady, uh, they dug up, uh, she had objects on her, and those objects, um, the Haudenosaunee people had been trying to claim it as their culture. They said, well, it's not your culture. This is definitely Ojibwe culture. She had a special comb in her possession, and that comb had a carved image on the handle, and that image was that of a Mishupishu. So, anybody know what a Mishupishu is? Come on. What kind of scholars are you? <laughs> okay, so, so the uh, Mishupishu is a very powerful figure, and it's, uh, it's on my painting there from Mark. Uh, so the Mishupishu is an underwater panther, and that's my clan. So when I, you know, I do my introduction, I say, Anishinaabe Shinikajwa, Anishinaabe Mishkogia, Shinikichi Manadu. Dodo Mishupishu, Nimwa Shani, Lakota Potawatam, Ojibwe, Algonquin, Mississauga, Nimwa Moa. So that's my traditional acknowledgement to myself. And uh, But that Mishupishu is my clan. So when I, and he, you know, this is the underwater panther. It's the most powerful creature in the underworld. And it's there to protect us humans if we get stuck down there. And that creature comes and protects you. So if you know that, you ever get stuck in the underworld, just say, hey, Mr. Pichu, I need you. And 
sounds funny, but I'm, tri I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is we're going to so the Haudenosaunee, after breaking the treaty with the three fires, they are forced out in uh, 1694. The leaders, uh, Sagamaw. So this is a medicine wheel. Uh, this is in Hyde Park. Uh, there's one in Hyde Park. It's not built like this, but there is one in a place there. There's a mound by the restaurant in Hyde Park, you know, the big parking lot. That hill is at the top of that hill one time, a long time ago, had a medicine wheel. So the medicine wheel was a, an astronomical observatory. Those tangent lines running out from the center pointed to different star formations that would arrive on the end of those points. And when it arrived on the end of those points, it would say, hey, it's time to harvest this, trying to plant that. So that's what these were for. Calendars were marking at different points in the year and help us to know when we should plant and harvest those things and when we can uh, get our crops. So, okay, next. One more. So, so re the reason why I'm talking about all this stuff and talking about identity is because this identity is connected with um, this really great diagram. So you can see the ancestors, you can see where we are. We're in this little kind of uh, depression in the present. And the future uh, is our, where we are looking to go. So according to elders, and myself I believe it too, and the teachers and people who are in the education field, they say that uh, we're in the present. Well, we can go up and over that hill and go forward into the future. We could do that. That'd be okay. We, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to see what those guys saw. So we need to go back and see what they saw first. Because they had the original vision about where we were going to go. So we're gonna, we have to go back and take a look at what they could see. The only way to go back and see what they see is to go back and do what they did. So go back and do your sun dance, go back and do your vision quests, go back and do your sweat ceremonies. Go do all those ceremonies and experience what that is because that is where the blood memory is. So when you re reenact an event that was um, part of your culture, you're opening up this doorway to, the pot, to this memory that's built into your DNA that awakens it, it awakens it and it begins to say, hey, this is the right way, this is where I'm going to go. So when you get to this place where you can open up and access that uh, blood memory, then you're opening up your mind to, the, to new visions about possibilities of the future. And who's to say that the ancestors didn't plant that vision in your head so that you would know exactly where to go? Right? Okay, next. So this is uh, where I come from. These are the these are the reserves that I belong to uh, through my lineage. So there's Cape Croker, and there's Moose Deer Point, and there's Magneto. And so those two are where, so my grandmother and grandfather, my grandfather comes from Moose Deer Point, my grandmother comes from Cape Croker, my dad comes from Magneto. So my dad is Algonquin and Mohawk. And my mom is Shawnee, Lakota, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Mississauga. And um, those are the reserves that those two... Um, so the reserve with the Shawnee, Lakota, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe, that's the, where the Cape Croker is. So, um, so next, and this, these are my uh, great-grandfathers. So Mashkogiyash is the first one on the, on the left. Then you have... Uh, Charles Keegan Oates Jones. And so he was, um, he's Lakota. So he, he was, um, he's the descendant of, um, so he's the descendant of Keegan Oates. So he's the son of Keegan Oates. And Keegan Oates was the, the one uh, uh, Lakota leader that came to support the Council in the War of 1812. And so it's his, uh, Keep it on, it's his children, the Tecumseh's children that come together to make my family up. That's why I'm here. And uh, so that's, uh, it's also him. Charles Keep it on, when he's uh, older and he's got the headdress on. 
and he's got a rifle in his hand. And so he didn't let any of these uh, church people come and take the kids to residential school, apparently. And uh, so let's move on. So there's my dad, and there's my mom. So Gerald and, and Beverly, and there's my grandfather and grandfather, and my grandmother. So and this is Harvey and Ethel. And next. So this is me uh, with my daughter and her first twins. And the guy on the left there is uh, Richard, that's uh, my son-in-law's uh, father. I don't, I don't know, those are cousins, I guess, those other kids. And next. One more. So this is Kate Coper. Uh, my family helped build this, uh, this church. It's a United Church in Cape Croker, and built in uh, 1892. It's up on the Bruce Peninsula. And uh, so my family were the Jones family, and they were, uh, they had that church they would go to every Sunday. They had their sweat lodge out in the bush, so they wouldn't tell the uh, institution or the authority about these, because they weren't allowed to practice. So it was a hidden thing for a long time. Uh, probably until 1952. So in 1952, the Indian Act changed its uh, mode of, uh, of um, what do you call them, um, where they outlawed you from practicing your culture. They changed the, that, uh, that law uh, in the Indian Act. And it didn't happen until 1952. <coughs> so, uh, sorry, but uh, the, uh, so 1960, uh, indigenous people could not vote until 1960. So that's not that long ago, right? So next, so this is my, uh, this is my great aunt. She's with my, uh, my uncle there, Sam, and my aunt, Ellen, and my mom is in the red in the center, and my uncle Kenny's in the background. And Uncle Norman's over there on the chair, but Auntie, Auntie Lena, uh, she was a Baptist minister, so she used to go around. Her and Norman, Irene, and, and um, Alfred used to go around to all the uh, uh, communities in the, around Georgian Bay, uh, saving indigenous people and, and converting them to Christianity. So, and they used to sing. They had these uh, guitars and, and they had some, uh, you know, percussion instruments and they would go around and they would be saving these indigenous people, but they wouldn't be saving us, but uh, they didn't like us too much because we were traditional and they were always trying to, you know, convert us. But we were just, uh, we were just too, uh, I don't know, activist-like. We were just, it was very hard for us to accept that change. But I understand why you know, they were like that, because this is a very interesting story I'm going to tell you. Uh, my Aunt Elena, uh, she was, uh, people were very rugged in those, those days. This is, you know, just after 1900, um, like she's, she's in her 90s there. And uh, that's probably in the, in the mid 80s. She was very old. And, um, but she was really strong. She was able to do many things into her until she got really sick. And when she was young, uh, our communities were really in a shambles. Uh, and even in a societal way, uh, there was a lot of alcoholism, probably drug use. Uh, so there was a lot of violence in our communities. And so she ended up in this party and uh, she was beaten up and left on a, on a railway track. And the train came and it hit her. And she threw her right off the track. And uh, she ended up in the ditch. Um, the next day, someone found her. Uh, her jaw was almost missing. So uh, she went to the hospital. They said there was no hope for this jaw to ever be fixed again. And uh, she decided she was going to go to church to see if she could find another way to live. She went to a Baptist church, and they came and they worked on her. They did this healing on her, and her jaw began to mend. 
and all the bones began to form and fall back into place, and her jaw healed. And so she became a devout Baptist minister after that, and that's what changed her life, and that's why she did it. So it's a, you know, it's a, there's a lot of like, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of opposites that have to come together to make that happen. And uh, so she was very much always praying around us, and, and she was always trying to get us to help her do her holy things. So, you know, we were young. We didn't, we didn't know, and we just did our best to try and make her happy. Um, <laughs> so that's Auntie Lena. <laughs> and uh, that's where the church was on East Deer Point. I put a little map there. I don't know, if you guys ever travel around, go check out East Deer Point. Go check out West Soxie and Perry Island. Try to go to the powwow. Look on the internet. You can see when that powwow is going to happen, and maybe, well, I'll meet you there. <laughs> That'll be fun. Okay, next. So I just wanted to share some of my ancestral history. There's Tecumseh. Uh, he's my great grandfather. And then my other great grandfather is here on the Toronto Purchase. So that first name up at the top there, that's my grandfather there. His name is Chichak. So Chichak is my great great grandfather. And he is connected through my grandmother too, Ethel. Ethel um, had all these connections with. Uh, Chichak and Tecumseh, so both of those lineages run through her family, and in that family there's all kinds of chiefs, even up till recent times, those family members, the Joneses, are still chiefs of that reserve. So there's a lot of leadership in this family. That stick there is, uh, is like a, a messenger stick. Uh, that was, they call it the sacred slab, like in the, in the uh, archives, in those books, in historic books. And that plaque there is, uh, I didn't know it was going to be seen so poorly here, but the plaque there is, it tells you exactly to come see him. I'm at his birthplace, so he went to Ohio to go see where my grandfather was born, because it was that place right there that they had set up this uh, big shift camp, because his mother was going to give birth that day, and said, oh, we got to make camp here. So he had the baby that, that day, that night before the baby was being born, just while the baby was being born, uh, a big meteorite went across the sky, and it was a big green one. It created this green light as it streaked across the sky. And so, that's how Tecumseh got his name. That name, Tecumseh, means panther crossing the sky. And, it, and the only meteorite that you could call that was a green one, because that panther has a green eye. That's why they said it was the panther crossing the sky. So that's how Tecumseh got his name. And so, you know, his name is a prophetic uh, name. All of us have a, a spirit name, and it's a prophetic name. So his name, you know, they call him, well, the settlers were calling him Shooting Star. Because, but, you know, that's what his name meant, that that Shooting Star is seen by everyone, and so everyone saw him because he went across the whole continent uh, gathering an alliance to defend the original territory from these new settlers that were encroaching upon all their sacred places. So next. So this is Tecumseh. I put him in again because he represents the, he, he defended Canada. Probably if it wasn't for him and his alliance, the Americans would have come up here and taken all this land. But they were terrified of the indigenous warriors especially when it came to hand-to-hand -hand combat. Indigenous warriors were very skilled fighters, and the uh, American soldiers, they were terrified of them. So uh, then I have my uncles that were in World War II. There's a couple of them in this picture. And then this picture here represents the indigenous uh, people that were here in this territory, so Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Odawa, Chippewa, Algonquin, they were all here supporting this land. They were defending this land here in Ontario in 1694. And that belt there is a symbol of that connection with these five different communities that came to, to protect the land. And Sagamaw, he was one of those leaders defending the land here in southern Ontario from the uh, encroaching forces of the Haudenosaunee that was um, led by the Mohawks. Uh, 
of the, um, I can't remember the place it's called, but the Mohawks were over there on the kind of uh, eastern end of Lake Ontario in the marshes area. So that's a Bay of Puente. So that's where they came from. And I uh, just wanted to show you some of this history that even though we've had this kind of uh, opposition with uh, the settlers in Parchapan, but we still felt um, like uh, an obligation to protect this land, even if they were on it with us. Because we knew that this land was still ours, even if they were in control of it, we still wanted to protect our home territory. So that's what that represents, those, those warriors all defending this land over the last you know, 350 years. Next. So this is, uh, this is the Niagara Treaty. That's a really terrible picture. And uh, this is, uh, it's big. This is like uh, 16 feet long. Uh, and part of it's uh, 13 feet high down at this end. And that's seven feet over there. Uh, but this has all the indigenous nations that were part of the signing of that Niagara Treaty. And the Niagara Treaty was the beginning of the uh, of the um, Indian Act. So this is the first time that indigenous people were given any representation. Uh, these uh, laws and um, rules were put into the, the Niagara Treaty to protect indigenous people from anyone coming to to try and take land. And so the only way a person could take land is that he had to go through the British government to take that land. And that was the only way. And it was made sense because there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of reckless uh, leadership back then from the indigenous side. Uh, people were selling land on other nations and it wasn't even their land to sell. So there was a lot of that going on. And that created a lot of conflict and there was a lot of war. So uh, the Mississaugas migrated from a place called the Mississauga River. They were part of this last thing, you know, with the, you saw that belt with those five diamonds. Those diamonds each represent a fire and represented a community. And that shell represented the sun. So as long as the sun shines, you know, that, that uh, treaty was um, in operation. So, um, so they came down here in 1696 to defend the land against the invasion of those Mohawks. Sagamore was one of the leaders. Uh, Chief Yellowhead was another leader. There was two battle sites. One was Skull Mountain and the other was Skull Island. And the place is called Nottawasaga. You know Nottawasaga Bay? That's the place of the battle. And that's what that word means, place of the battle. <clears throat> so even uh, even place names are right under your nose and you don't know that, you know, that there's history with that one name. So the treaties are forged with the Mississaugas. So 1805 was the Toronto Purchase uh, Treaty 13. Head of the Lake Treaty was 14. Uh, Jank uh, was Treaty 19, Treaty 22 in 1820, Treaty 23 in 1820. Rouge Trap Claim was uh, 2015. And then uh, Fort York was built on, in 1793. Fort York is where the British soldiers, First Nations warriors, and Upper Canada militia stood together against the United States and their mission to capture Toronto in the War of 1812. The leader of the Allied Indigenous forces at the time was Tecumseh. So that, I have a lot of very important history and connections in this uh, country. And, and you know, when I was growing up, I didn't think much of this. I didn't really understand like what it really meant. Uh, of course, I was now, you know, because I realized that how important all these things are right now. But this is uh, sometimes you know you have history in your hands, and you just don't know how important it is because it's your family history. It's, oh, it's only my family, you know. Like who's going to know? Who cares? But as you get to the place where your mind is open and more expanded, and you can see better that this history is all important because you may be a small thread, but that's a small thread that nobody else knows about, and it's important to share that. So that's a message to all you guys. So in the index in 1966 edition of the Henry Shannon's Toronto of the Old, there are a few mentions of indigenous people, but the following do appear, Mohawk, 
Mississauga, Onondaga, Onondaga, not as uh, nations or communities with any humanity, but as schooners or warships named after these feared groups. So that just goes to show you how far back the marginalization is happening. So this is, we're talking about 1966, and that's, this is, you know, this is the modern, considered modern era. When you're in the 60s in this country, we're in modern times, and yet no mention is of these original inhabitants is really enough to bring um, any notice of. So did the adoption of the savage Indian mascot used by American leaves and the military complex such as the Redskins, Craves of the U.S. military's Apache helicopter and Tomahawk missile emerge into the mid-1700s British North America. So uh, Tecumseh of Portrait dismantling a myth as an agent to change. This is my master's thesis. The history of the fiction of indigenous people remain a uh, crucially important issue. One only has to consider the American debate on the name of Washington, D.C. football team, the Redskins. Supporters of the name uh, state believe it, it penetrates centuries old derisive bigoted and imperialistic ideas about the difference in the character of indigenous peoples. This contemporary derogatory uh, distortion of indigenous peoples through uh, the use of the term Redskins illustrates the important need for indigenous scholars and community workers to present a counter narrative to dis displace the colonial imperial mythology embedded in American and Canadian history. So that is in my thesis. Um, you know, it was a very intense thesis because if you can imagine, you know, 80 pages of that kind of writing, it was brutal. <laughs> it was really brutal. Uh, so um, here, okay, so, you know, this is really important. You guys, it's so important to know. Here are the names of the many nations connected to the original people of this land who you are seeing here in the fact the migration across the land uh, one of these nations represents 5,000 years to become uh, distinct as a language and branch beyond the original creation story. So what this is, is that it's a list of names. And so it's the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi, Algonquin, Chippewa, Nominee, Autogamy, Fox, Cree, Eastern, Moose Cree, Swampy Cree, Plains Cree, Nipissing, Tuf Kamiwan, Mississauga, Sock, Fox, Nandicote, Winnebago, Delaware, Blackfoot, Arapaho, Dakota, Nakota, uh, uh, Abenaki, Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, Pesamakwedi, Malasi, Mi'kmaq, Western Apanaki, Massachusetts, Mohican, Mansi, Nanico, Powhatan, Carolina, Illinois, Shawnee, Na Narragansett, Mohegan, Pequot, and Luke. So those are all connected to the Ojibwe. And so what that means is basically is that uh, this is your, when you see all these different names, you are looking, and when you can have it in a list like that, you can look at it as a migration across all this land. Because wherever they are settled in uh, here, right across Canada, down into the United States, down into Washington, D.C., uh, they are all part of the Ojibwe people. They've been here a long time. And you know what? It's a million years, it doesn't seem like it's out of reach that they've been here that long, that there's that many nations connected with one nation. And how they know that is because they all belong to the same language family. But you see, there's only one last page to read here, which is great. Oh no, so there's two more. So the Ojibwe arrived before, um, okay, no. I have this happen now. Oh, 
Okay, I guess that was it. Okay, so let's go finish this. So this is the uh, beginning of the residential school. Uh, I wrote it up there. Uh, you know, it says that we didn't get the book until 1960. Uh, residential school started around the 1850s. And uh, it, so it wasn't until 1953 that they amended to the Indian Act to remove sections that uh, restricted customs and culture. So 1952 was the point at which we uh, decriminalized the indigenous culture. That was the year it began. So by the 1960s, that's when people began to come out more and, and uh, begin to start practicing their culture openly. And it was at that time that our young people began in the 1960s going to the elders to find out who they were. And so this is how that Seven Fires connects, because the Seven Fires talks about the seventh fire when the young people begin to go to our elders to find out what this knowledge is and who they are. It said that is the time that this is the beginning of the seventh fire when that happens. So not only did our young people go looking to our elders for this knowledge, but so did the young settler children. They started going too. And so what did they become known as? And they even mentioned it. They mentioned this, that these young people would be recognized as the flower children, right? They said that 1,200 years ago. So this is really important stuff. And uh, so these guys represent, uh, these guys, this was just before they went into uh, residential school in 1892. They were going into residential school. This is what they looked like when they went in, and when they came out, I didn't get the picture, I couldn't find it. But they had a picture of them in their little suits, and their hair all chopped off, they didn't look the same at all. So next. Uh, just, uh, just, so this is, uh, that's a map of the migration route of Buffalo. Uh, Three billion acres of land they would migrate through. It would take a full year to go around this whole thing. And there was uh, 60 million buffalo here in North America. And there's some of the evidence of the decimation of the buffalo, just all those skulls. Uh, they were using them as fertilizer, and they were using them for china. So the best china came from England, and they were exporting that to England, not in that form. So what they would do here, they'd build these big fires and throw all the skulls in. And the skulls would turn to ash, and they would pack that ash and send that to England to make China. Yeah, down China. That's the, where it comes from. So Spode, the family of Spode, they were the one that started that process and they really understood that mixing that ash into the China clay made it super hard and they could make that China extra thin. So it became the thing that everybody wanted. I did my, uh, I was going to do my thesis on that, but they, I had a, uh, Assassin. One, one, of my, one of my professors was an assassin. And he took that away from me and said, hey, no, you can't do that. This is too good. And it was, I'll have to tell you that story in private. Whoever wants to hear that story, it's a big long story. Okay, next. Oh, yeah, so um, this is uh, the end. Uh, this is the eighth fire. This is about two cultures coming together and to create the new people. It's those two people coming together and making the new people called, these are the eight fire people coming up now. So all the young people that are going to school now, these are the eight fire. And they are going to have, uh, both these cultures are going to become part of their, their uh, knowledge. And it's going to be common. So this knowledge that I'm talking about today with you guys is going to be something that, we're, we, that is going to be common and it's going to be part of everybody's thinking and understanding. And I don't know how it will go, but I think it's, uh, it's going to go for you. Uh, for me personally, I, I feel good about the whole thing, sharing this knowledge. And uh, anyways, thank you for listening. Be rich. Well, it's a little later than what we had planned. Um, but
But uh, what I'm going to suggest is for those of you who can stick around, uh, we're going to put some juice and cookies in the back there. And if people want to just talk informally, um, I personally, I have to be on a plane very early tomorrow morning and I'm going to have to leave because otherwise I will not get up in the morning. Um, so, but I invite people to gather and, uh, and then I'm going to ask maybe uh, if we can shorten up the time um, and the suggestion would be, my suggestion would be, if people could just chat amongst themselves, um, if you want to stay, and talk about, um, we learned a lot, I think that to talk about what we learned would be too, uh, too much, but talk about, um, like, some actions that, that you're inspired by, to take by what you heard this evening, if people would talk about that, and then, um, I'm going to suggest because of the late hour that we probably won't come back together um, to talk about that, but just share amongst each other, if that's okay. And thank you very much again. Thank you.